Hey everyone, it's Joseph, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about how I go about organizing colors for a UI or web design project. I'm not saying it's the best way to do it, but I thought it might be worth sharing my own personal workflow, just in case you guys are lacking in inspiration or feeling a little disorganized or just overwhelmed by how many frickin' colors you got by the time you reach the end of a design project. This video is sponsored by our friends at Skillshare. So let's just say hypothetically that you're already working with an established brand. Let's say you're doing this work for a client or you're doing this work for yourself and you've already established sort of a brand palette of colors. To remain in line with the branding, I'm gonna have to consider these colors pretty much locked. I can't go in and get creative with them because then I'd be deviating from the brand that's already been established. So to stay true to these colors means kind of just leaving them alone. So here I've got four colors and there's really not much I can do with them except pull from them and use them appropriately in my design work. So I may, for example, carry over the primary brand color as a layout color. Now our layout colors are gonna make up most of the structure of our design. It's gonna be our background elements, really our foreground elements, title text, subtitle text, body text. What I like to do, I'll carry over a primary brand color and see if it works on both a light and dark background. And if it does, I'll consider that color versatile enough that I can make use of it as a layout color. The next color I like to get hammered down is the low contrast neutral. So on the light side, it's gonna be a very light gray, just enough contrast so that you can see it, very useful for sidebars, form fields, things of that nature that don't need to stand out very much, but do need to be their own containers. On the dark side, it's gonna be a dark color that contrasts subtly with its own respective background. And then from there, we can go and we can create our higher contrast background color. And in this case, the higher contrast on the light side is the dark background that you see behind everything on the right and the high contrast light color that you see on the right is the background that you see on the left. So that is our highest contrast color. We're essentially establishing our whites and our blacks. So white doesn't have to be absolute white. It doesn't have to be F, 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 however many Fs make six for the hex code white. But then I like to have sort of a reduced version of both of those. Um, on the light side, you see that I have a dark gray that's not quite as dark as that color that's being used as the dark background. And uh, on the dark background side, you can see that I have uh, a lighter shade that isn't quite as light as the color being used as the background on the left. What's cool here is that these two new colors are actually our older, lower contrast colors just crossed over to the other side. The reason for that is we get to save on having extra colors and at the same time we come up with a color that's low contrast but useful on one background and high contrast but useful on the other background. It's good for things like subtitles, even body text and things of that nature. This keeps things so super clean and organized without ending up with a bunch of extra shades of gray. Save the 50 shades of gray for your lonely single Aunt Linda. So now that we got our layout colors hammered down, we're ready to talk about what I call denotive colors because the colors actually mean something. The first denotive color that you might wanna set aside for yourself is some sort of shade of red to indicate an error state or a state of something having gone wrong. Now, if one of your brand colors happens to be red, I would highly recommend not using that same red color for your error color as to not make your brand synonymous with failure. So if red means bad, Green generally means good. So the next color that I'll set aside for myself would be some sort of shade of green for success messaging and things of that nature. Now, if your brand colors happen to be green or green-ish, it's not a problem to use the same branded green color for your success color because it's not a problem for your brand to be synonymous with success. Now you'll notice with these two denotive colors, they span across from the light side to the dark side because personally, I would rather use just one color that's appropriate for both. The denotive color that's fundamentally different is the disabled state because this is grayed out in a sense that's essentially low opacity. So low opacity on light is even lighter, low opacity or low contrast on dark is even darker. So we're gonna need two distinctly separate shades of gray. On the light side, we've got a lighter shade of gray. On the dark side, we've got a darker shade of gray. And if we slide the dark side over, 
part, you can see that they are two distinctly different colors. Now, another important thing to mention about the disabled states is that even though they're a reduced contrast with their own respective background, they've got to have enough contrast that they're readable. This is an accessibility issue. You don't know what kind of screens people are using. You don't know what kind of eyeballs people are using. They could be pretty bad. So just be absolutely sure that the content is readable, even though the visibility is reduced in a sense. Now, last but not least, we have interactive colors. And when it comes to interactive colors, I try to use as few as possible. If it's possible, try to use one color that's your primary interactive color, a color for things that people can touch and people can click. I'm not trying to stifle your creativity, but there is this concept of cognitive overhead, as it's referred to, where people have to learn how to use your website and learn how to use your app and essentially learn how to navigate. They've never been there before. They've got to figure it out when they arrive. It can either make sense and be easy on their brain, or it can be something new and unfamiliar where they have to learn. Now, the least that we can do is be consistent so that once people learn, they've learned once and they can apply what they've learned throughout the rest of the experience interacting with your app or with your website. Once one simple way to do that is just to use fewer colors for interactive elements. So I'll start with one basic color. It doesn't have to be blue. It can be any color. It can be your brand color even. And with that color established, I'll make a lighter version and a darker version. So that way I'll have a hover state or a tap state or, you know, some alternate interactive state to show that the user is making contact with that button, depending on whether it's touch or they're going to be using a mouse with a cursor. Beyond that, I'll add an even lighter and even darker shade so that if I do have a rollover state and then I want to show that it's been pushed in, I've got all my bases covered. I'll also use either plus one or minus one in my naming convention if I'm saving my colors into a design system like Envision DSM. So that way, if I glance quickly at a shade of blue and I think it's middle blue, if I see plus one, then I know that that's not the middle blue, that it's the brighter version and I've got to look for zero to find that middle blue. Good naming conventions and something like Envision Design System Manager can make life a lot easier. So that's the gist of it. I start with my brand colors. I work out my layout colors. I've got my denotive colors, which are more of a necessary evil than anything else else. And then from there, I've got my interactive color in shades or colors, depending on what I'm trying to pull off. If you guys want to learn more about color or design in general, or see where I learned how to make the motion graphics that are in this particular video, check out Skillshare if you're not already on Skillshare. There are more than 17,000 classes about design, motion graphics, color, and all that stuff on Skillshare. And a premium membership is only 10 bucks a month for unlimited access to all the courses, which is way cheaper than buying one course at a time. Trust me, I've blown a lot of my own money. <laughs> Since this video is being sponsored by Skillshare, you'll find a promo link in the description below. And the first 200 people to use that link will get two months free to try it out risk-free. Once you get over there, if you want to check out one of my personal favorite courses, it's called Logo Design with Draplin. It's a course where you get to look over Aaron Draplin's shoulder and see how he works. He's not a dictator. He just shows you, hey, here's what I do. And I love his style and I love his work. And if you're not familiar with Aaron Draplin, then that's reason enough to go check that course out. I had a chance to meet him at Adobe Max last year, and he's super rad, super humble. And we used to eat at the same In-N-Out Burger. Small world. We're beef brothers. Anyways, please subscribe if you haven't already. And if there are other aspects of my design workflow that you're curious about and want me to share with you, leave that stuff in the comments below and I'll keep more videos coming soon. This is the smallest bottle of water I've ever seen. I didn't buy this, my mom handed me this at Thanksgiving dinner, a feast of abundance. She hands me this, I'm dehydrated. She hands me the smallest freaking water bottle in America.